Thoughts and it got his uh, was an undergraduate at Harvard, I think, and did his PhD at Stanford, and has a number of laurels to his account, including things like uh, Sloan, uh, Sloan uh, Fellowship, a uh, career grant from NSF, uh, invited speaker at ICM, and the Levey Prize in, in probability. It's only awarded every two years. And certainly, looked at a list of winners, it's an extremely impressive list. So, uh, also, when you look to see the things in uh, his CV that he worked on, including like uh, random surfaces, uh, Gaussian free field, SLE, quantum gravity, uh, diffusion limited aggregation, uh, conformal welding. There's things on Lipschitz extensions, optimal Lipschitz extensions, applications of game theory to PDE. I think there's a paper on nonlinear Schrodinger equation in there someplace. There's a, trem there's a tremendous amount of probability and analysis. And, to me, the, the interactions of probability and harmonic analysis and complex analysis, one of the most interesting things uh, going on in mathematics today. I, I think the Fields uh, Medal Committee also agrees with this. And uh, it, it's a fascinating area, and we're very, very happy to hear something about it from one of the really great world experts in, in the topic. So please welcome uh, Scott Sheffield, who's speaking on Thank you. Thank you. So today, <clears throat> I'm going to discuss a number of topics uh, which became very popular during the 1980s when computers became prevalent and people could do simulations. Um, uh, all of these things on this first list here uh, have at least some roots uh, earlier than that, but kind of really took off in the popular imagination when people could see them. And we'll see during this talk that visual, visualizations have played an important role in this, in this subject. Um, we're going to start by saying a few things about complex dynamics, uh, Julia sets, and something called matings of Julia sets. These are things that probably a third of this audience knows more about than I do, including Chris uh, Bishop, who just introduced me. Um, but I will nonetheless try to do my best. And then I'll move on. and. Uh, and talk about various canonical random objects that have emerged versus what's the natural notion of a random tree. Uh, and next, a random surface. So this is a topic that emerged in the context of string theory uh, when Polyakov wanted to describe the time evolution of a string and thought about integrating over spaces of random surfaces. And it sort of blossomed into a, a huge subject that's now called quantum gravity. Um, uh, I'll talk about random paths. What's the canonical notion of a random path? And there's something called schramm lovner evolution. And then random growth models, ETA model, DLA. And, um, and after that, I'm going to describe how all of these things are somehow related to each other. Um, so over the past several years, we found a number of unexpected connections between these various characters. Um, uh, so first of all, it seems that in some sense you can glue together random surfaces to produce ALE, SLE. You can glue together random trees in ways inspired by these uh, conformal dynamics matings in order to create uh, kind of space filling curves and pairs of continuum trees um, and spherical geometries, which are then also related to SLE and these quantum gravity surfaces. And then all that somehow ties in to DLA, these various crazy growth models. And there's some surprising tractability here. Now, the work I'm going to discover here is mostly contained in uh, this series of papers here, which uh, between them, it's about 900 pages. And a good chunk of it is with, uh, with Jason Miller. Some of it is also with uh, Bertrand Duplantier. So it's a lot of material. Um, I'll have to cover this, I think, at about a, a page every four seconds. Um, but you know, I'll try to give a good overview of what this subject is about. Um, OK, so first of all, if uh, any of you, like me, were nerdy kids in the 1980s, um, you probably had some friends in high school who had books like this one, Fractal Programming in C, published in 1989. And you used to make pretty pictures. Um, one of the things you probably made were these so-called Julia sets. And I'll, um, uh, Tab over to this if I can. Right, so for example, here are uh, P 
pictures of Julia sets you're probably all familiar with. Um, so what are these things exactly? Well, okay. Uh, so, okay. Let me say it up here. So, you know, consider this map phi z equal to z squared. This maps the complement of a disk to itself in a two to one way. Okay, everyone here knows this. So if I take z to z squared, um, I call it phi z equals z squared, that uh, sends the inside of the unit disk to the inside of the unit disk, maps the boundary to the boundary. But what I care about here is that it maps the outside to the outside. And um, you know, I can repeatedly iterate that. It always takes points in the outside to itself. So if I repeatedly iterate this map, points outside will always stay on the outside, points inside will stay on the inside. Um, OK, now if k is any other compact set, like maybe a square or something, I give you a set k, then I can, of course, map the complement of k to the complement of k. As you would expect, take the schwartz christoffel map up to here, map over here by this 2 to 1 map, and then pull it back down to here. Okay. I'm so embarrassed to be saying this in front of this crowd, but you know, yes. So, this, so you can do this, um, and, uh, but you, know, you might kind of think the more complicated this k gets, the more complicated this map might be. If it's a square, you have some weird schwartz christoffel map, or if it's a polygon, you have some other, it might get more complicated. But what, what was su surprising to people who did not know this thing already is that, th in fact, some of the craziest sets, most beautiful sets you could dream of, actually have the very simplest maps, two to one maps from the complement of the from set to itself. Um, and uh, and those are those described uh, by these Julia sets. So basically, um, so you, again, you might expect a more intricate k would yield a more intricate map. But suppose we just fix what we want phi of b to be. Let phi of k be, say, z squared plus c. So we just determine in advance what we want phi to be. And then we just let k be the set of points that stay bounded if you repeatedly iterate phi. And then the complement is a set of points that drift off to infinity when you repeatedly iterate phi. And, um, and it turns out that those sets look like those crazy pictures I showed you. Now, um, I want to show uh, some pictures Arnaud Cheritard uh, drew of something called matings of these trees. So it turns out that, or of these Julia sets. So, so this Julia set comes with a natural measure on it. Because um, you know, I, I have a map, and I just can take uniform measure on, say, the disk up here, and pull it back here to get a uniform measure on the boundary of this set. You know, harmonic measure viewed from infinity, basically. So this set comes with a natural measure, and this map here, this two-to-one map, preserves the measure. So it comes with a measure with what they call a dynamics on the measure, and. Um, And you might say, what if we take two of these Julia sets, two of these crazy looking sets, whatever they look like, and try to um, identify points on the boundary of one set with points on the boundary of the other in a measure preserving way along the boundary. I just go along the boundary and just kind of draw a line and then kind of topologically, I look at the quotient. You know, these two things are metric spaces. They have a topology. They're embedded in the plane. And I just quotient out by this identification. And it turns out, amazingly, when you see it for the first time, but somehow this, this quotient actually is a, a sphere. In many cases, topologically a sphere. And it's a little harder to get your head around 
what that means. So I have these pictures produced by Arnold Sherry Toss. So let me pull these up. So I will uh, tab over to here. All right, here we go. Two Julia sets, and watch as they come and glue together. OK. So he kind of made this happen gradually, so you can appreciate what's actually happening. So at the end of the day, you have two Julia sets embedded in the plane conformally. And so somehow I've assigned a conformal structure to this gluing together of these two guys. And um, the interface between these two guys is now a curve. So it, it's basically, tra as I trace the boundary of one of these guys, or equivalently the other of these guys, I'm tracing out a curve which kind of snakes in between the blue and the yellow. OK, what's amazing, though, is there are some Julia sets that are actually, they don't look like the one I showed here, with all these, which is basically a tree of bubbles. It looks more just like a dendritic tree. So let me show you that. So as we finish this one, well, it will spin around for a minute for you first. And now watch this. So here we have a tree on one side, which is also a Julia set of a different polynomial. Hooking up. I mean, isn't that nice? And so now, again, the boundary, the interface between the two is again a space filling curve. But now look at this two trees. Or it's not a space, it's a curve. I take two trees. And this is what's hard to get your head around. You have two trees which both have measure 0. You quotient them together, and you get this sphere. And the interface between the two trees now becomes a space-filling curve, one of these piano-style curves. It hits every single point in, in space. Okay. So again, I thank Arnaud Sherry Todd for these images. Um, well, I don't have his permission, but I'm, he put them on his website, so I assume it's OK. Um, but you know, I just think these are, these are beautiful. Now, one, one thing you notice um, with these Julia sets is that if you take uh, your, your, your Julia set here, and I give you, say, some, um, well, imagine some crazy set here. I, I, I give you some little neighborhood of the set here. The pre-image of the neighborhood under this map is going to be a, a pair of neighborhoods, right? And the pre-image under the square of map will then be like four little neighborhoods, or eight little neighborhoods in the boundary. But in particular, that means that if this is a neighborhood that contains a ch chunk of the Julia set, then the Julia set looks the same in all of these other little neighborhoods up to a conformal map of a polynomial transformation by a polynomial map. So that gives you this amazing kind of exact self-similarity. If I look at the structure at this scale, it's repeated everywhere throughout this thing, you know, all sorts of smaller and smaller scales. So you have this really exact self-similarity. Now, most of what I'm going to be talking about today, we'll be trying to mate together objects um, and make sense of objects that don't have this sort of exact self-similarity. They have self-similarity in law, um, Brownian motion, things like that. And we will have to use different tools uh, to make sense of these matings. OK, so let me go back. Oops, command. OK. All right. So of course, in the 80s, you know, these things were all the rage. I mean, everyone uh, made pictures of these on their computers, right? These Julia sets. Um, you would sit home, and it would, it would take all day to have it actually appear on your computer. You'd start the program in the morning and come home at night, and it would be half the screen full, and you'd be so excited. Um, and you know, words, chaos, butterfly effect, fractal, self-similar, all these things entered the popular lexicon. You'd read them in, in Time magazine or Newsweek. Everyone was kind of talking about how somehow these, these Julia sets, these ideas, were really kind of the secret to everything. OK. But now what about these random fractals? 
All right, well, here is the easiest example of a random fractal to explain, random tree. So here, what I've done here is um, this is a continuum random tree. So what I do here is I take a Brownian excursion, goes up, comes down here, and then I draw these green lines under it. And I consider the graph of this Brownian excursion, that's a, well, it's just a curve embedded in the plane. But then I do a quotient on this graph where I declare two points to be equal if they're on this green horizontal line under the graph connects to them. And when I glue these things together, this thing collapses to become a tree. Okay. Um, now you can probably see a discrete version of this quite easily if I, if I give you a, a simple random walk that goes up and down like this. You can collapse the undersides of these guys, and then you'll just get, I guess it would be a tree like this. And so if I start from here and I, um, I trace the boundary of the tree and consider my length, my distance from the root, the distance from the root goes to 1, 0, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 0, which is what this graph is doing, 1, 0, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 0. So just collapsing this gets to here. And it's easy to see this as a bijection from pictures like this to pictures like this. And um, basically taking the continuum limit of this object where you choose this guy at random um, will then give you what we call a continuum random tree. Okay. So this is David Aldous um, in 1993. Although, I mean, these trees themselves, of course, are much older in the discrete case. But I believe, I mean, it's hard to believe this wasn't done before 1993, but I believe David Aldous was the first one to formalize uh, the construction of this continuum object. And he proved a lot of things about it. <coughs> OK. Um, so that's random trees, simple enough. Next after is what's the sort of canonical notion of a random path? OK, well, you all know Brownian motion is the most canonical random path, but that intersects itself a lot. I want sort of the canonical random path that doesn't cross itself. And um, it turns out that schramm novner evolution, these SLE curves, are a natural candidate for the most canonical random path. And uh, the way you construct that is as follows. So first, let me say SLE. Uh, for any domain, any planar domain D, and any pair of boundary points, A and B, SLE is a random curve. By the way, for any kappa parameter between 0 and infin infinity, SLE kappa is a random curve that starts at A and ends at B. And the parameter kappa indicates roughly how windy the path is. The larger kappa is, in some sense, the more this path is going to wind around. OK, and um, so we'd like to argue that this SLE curve is somehow canonical. Um, and I have to give you some symmetries that only these curves satisfy to make that point. So first of all, I want SLE to be conformal in the sense that if I give you another domain, d tilde, and a conformal map phi from d to d tilde, then the image of this curve over here is an SLE in the new domain from phi of A to phi of B. So my definition of SLE, again, is defined on any domain with any pair of boundary points. But now I'm telling you, if you define it on just one domain with one pair of boundary points, then you can map it over to any other domain with another pair of boundary points with any conformal map and, uh, and get a definition over there. Okay, so. So I'm just going to require that this symmetry hold. <coughs> and, uh, and the second property is that if I condition, if I start observing this path up to some stopping time, maybe the first time the path exits some ball or something, and I draw it up to that time and say, given this, what is the conditional law of the remainder of the path? Okay, Then the conditional law of the remainder of the path is simply an SLE in the new domain. The new domain being the original domain minus 
the path you've generated so far. Starting at the tip, ending here. Another way to think of that is that if, if I've drawn it up to here and I want to know what's the, what's the law of the remainder of the path, I could just generate a path, a red path from here to here, conformally map it here with the two tips going to these two points, and that would give me an instance of this remaining red curve. Okay? So that's, Markov property is very nice because it sometimes tells you if you know how to draw just a little piece of the path, you can kind of iterate that over and over and draw the whole path. So in some sense, all that matters is kind of how the path gets started. OK. And it was Oded Schramm who first um, kind of formalized these notions, these properties, and realized that this is exactly what you want your canonical curve to have. And, um, and he showed that these determine the law of SLE up to a single parameter denoted by kappa. There's only one parameter family curves that satisfy these properties. He gave an explicit construction, and you don't have to worry about this uh, too much for now, but you know, it basically involves taking these conformal maps from the complement of the curve generated up to time t. So from the half plane minus the curve generated up to time t to the half plane, as you generate it from, say, 0 to infinity within the half plane. And he showed that um, these particular normalizing maps uh, solve an ODE, which is called Lovner's equation. Um, and if you plug in this WT to be root kappa times Brownian motion, you get, uh, you can then work backwards and find these GTs and find the curves, and those are SLEs. Okay. I'm not going to spend much time uh, on that, but uh, that's the definition. Um, now, what Rhoda and Schramm proved is that uh, if kappa is equal to less than 4, these curves are simple uh, with probability 1. If kappa is between 4 and 8, these curves bounce off themselves. They're not space filling, but they're not simple either. They, they make these sort of loops. Um, uh, kind of suggestively like those curves we saw at the beginning when we glued together two uh, non-dendritic Julia sets. The curve between them would bounce off of itself, but it wasn't space filling. And then kappa is greater than or equal to 8, you get one of these space filling curves. But it's a curve that doesn't cross itself. So it is, in some ways, it looks like those, that curve we got by gluing together those two trees at the beginning. Those curves touch themselves, so why don't they, from like 4 to 8? Yes. It hits itself. Yes. Why does that mean it doesn't cross itself? Do you have some transversality that you're for? Yeah, so, so, so this isn't allowed. OK. But this is allowed. I mean, if you like it, it, it can be, you can get it as a uniform limit of simple curves. In particular, if it's a plane and you have a piece that is an old piece, yeah. you have to cross. That's right. Uniform, you know, this thing here is, is not close to a simple curve. But this thing is, if I squeeze this apart a little bit, it would be simple. So it's sort of a, right. um, I mean, crossing yourself, you know, it's that. Right. OK. Um, there's also a radio version of SLE, uh, which involves, um, well, again, I won't say much about exactly the, the formula, but essentially, in this radial SLE, what you have is a disk and a point in the center, and you're growing a curve in towards the center. In any case, you can conformally map back and look where the tip goes. Um, and I introduce this mainly because there's a variant called measure-driven Lovner evolution, where instead of saying you always grow from a tip, you can imagine that you grow from all over the, all over the boundary at once. That you could grow from many different places. And in that case, it's similar to Lovner evolution, except that you plug in a measure instead of a, a single point. Okay? So I just want to point out that that's within the realm of things uh, you can describe with Lovner evolution. And that will be important later. Okay, so, so what have we got? We've got random trees, we've got random curves. Next up on the list, random surfaces. What's the canonical notion of a random surface? Well, the discrete level, here's a simple way to create one. Start with a sheet of paper. Draw a pen and a ruler, get a pen and ruler, cut it into 12 equal sized pieces, say. Get out some scissors, cut them into these little squares. And now start 
stitching boundaries of the squares to each other. Get some glue, start picking pairs of edges and gluing them together. Now if you glued them all together in a nice neat way, you might recover your, your original object, but you can imagine that you're a little wilder than that. Maybe you glue this edge to this edge, this edge to this edge over here, this edge to this edge. You find some crazy pairing of the edges um, until every edge is paired with another edge. And um, these are sometimes called the, the drunk quilt maker models. You know, you know what? Quilt, again, I know this is only a word in English, but uh, quilt is the blanket you make by stitching little squares of fabric together. And, um, and if you imagine you're drunk enough to not make a flat quilt, but sober enough that it's still simply connected, then um, you have now described this model. Okay, so we'll assume that what you get at the end of the day is simply connected, and imagine you just choose uniformly from the set of all possible ways of producing a simply connected um, surface. Here's a, a physical one that one of my co-authors made. You, you actually glue together some triangles or, um, or squares and produce one of these guys. So you might ask, what is the structure of one of these guys when the number of faces is large? Well, here we go. This is 25,000 faces. This is uh, J.F. Marquette. Uh, he plugged this into some software that um, tries to embed this isometrically in three space as well as it can, and, um, and then project it onto two space and let you try to visually see what it looks like. This is some sense of what these surfaces are. And you see, they're, they're crazy fractal objects, like the trees, like the SLE curves. They're fractal. They look maybe self-similar. They have all these things uh, that you'd expect a natural fractal random surface to have. Um, now, these objects were first studied back in the 60s when Tut was working on the four-color theorem. And there are all sorts of variants, quadrangulations, et cetera. Some of them will come equipped with extra statistical physics structure. Maybe you have a distinguished spanning tree on the map or, a, um, or a, a spin function, what they call the easing model. You have some plus or minus spin assigned to each vertex. All these things are, come up in physics. And these can be interpreted as Riemannian manifolds with, well, conical singularities. I mean, you, you've, when you glue together, say, if you happen to glue together this way, so this edge is now glued to this edge, you're gluing three of these things at a face. So, so near this point, it looks like a cone rather than just like flat. So you have these, these discrete set of singularities. But other than that, it's just a, a manifold. You can do Brownian motion on it, whatever. A sample or it's a typical sample? This, I don't know what the distinction is. No, I mean, is it, I mean, are, is the, are most of the surfaces will look like that, or it's just the one, one particular example? Yeah, so the, the, this is um, generated randomly on a computer. So this should be a typical example. Now, I don't know if Marker actually generated a dozen of them randomly and picked out the prettiest one. Um, <laughs> it's hard to prove or disprove such a thing. but. Uh, but yeah, this is generally what they look like. OK, so um, and what, what has been proved in a number of works by several uh, authors over the last several years is that this thing actually converges in law in this gromov hofdorf space sense on the space of metric spaces to um, a random metric space, which is called the Brownian map, which is homeomorphic to the two-sphere. OK, and this limiting object is. Um, uh, it's sort of a, one way of thinking of a random surface. Um, at least it's a metric space, which is homeomorphic to the sphere. Um, OK, and an important tool in all of this is there are certain bijections that encode the surface with a pair of trees. Now here, the different thing you might look at, this is a random quadrangulation embedded in the plane. So if you look carefully, each one of these I have a bunch of quadrilaterals, except on the boundary. The boundary ones are triangles. But all the interior things are quadrilaterals, which have um, four vertices. Some of them have bent edges, but they have a black, red, or blue, red, blue, red. Vertex. So this is one way of embedding a quadrangulation. This is a random quadrangulation embedded in the plane. And um, here is a pair of trees. So this is a, a, a red 
tree, which is a spanning tree of the graph you get by um, kind of joining together diagonals, red to red diagonals of all these squares. So this is now a, um, I take a tree that's a subgraph of that graph of all diagonals, and then I take the dual tree, which I get by taking all the faces that don't have an edge in them yet and putting a blue edge in them. And this is now a pair of trees. Here they are, pair of trees. Does this remind you of our pair of trees at the beginning, at least somewhat, hopefully? Um, uh, and here is a pair of trees together with a curve that sort of snakes between them. That's this green curve. It, it goes, in, goes through all of these other edges, crossing them one at a time, snaking in between these trees. This is sort of a space filling curve that goes in between them. And so how do we actually produce this graph? Well, basically my, my co-author, uh, Jason Miller, produced these images. He first took every quadrilateral and subdivided it by putting this particular special pattern inside. And that pattern was designed to make sure that, um, uh, that I would get a triangulation with no double edges, no matter how the outsides were glued up. And so I, I introduced this little pattern in the middle. And now if I have a triangulation with no double edges, it's possible to sphere pack that, meaning uh, embedded in such a way that the center of um, each vertex becomes the center of a circle. And uh, if two vertices are adjacent in the graph, there's a circle this, their corresponding circles touch. Okay. And this is it's sometimes thought of as a, a, a way of conformally embedding a discrete graph in the plane. Okay. And here, they're colored according to the order in which they're encountered by the path. So this is another way of visualizing the space filling path through this conformal geometry. And notice some of the circles have different sizes. There's a certain fractal self-similarity here. Some places, it's very sparse. You just have a few big circles. In some places, it's very dense. The circles tend to be very small. Um, and in some sense, this sort of induces kind of a measure on this whole big disk, uh, where I just look at the counting measure on the circles. And um, so I, you know, I have a lot of measure here and only a little measure over here. Now, um, OK. And if you ask, what's the limit of this embedding? Well, these are related to conformal maps. So in general, in the continuum, um, how would I define a random surface? Well, we have this story that if I have any uh, simply connected Riemannian manifold, I can conformally map it to, say, the plane, the sphere, or the unit disk. Um, and if I give you any set up on my surface, I can look at his image set here. And the pullback of the area measure upstairs gives me an area measure downstairs. I can assign a measure of this set to be the measure, the area of the pre-image up in this set. And, um, uh, and then the metric for the surface down here will take the form, well, some positive function times, so the measure down here will be some positive function times Euclidean measure. And what we do is take uh, that positive function to be e to the rho of z for some rho. So we just choose rho so that that's the case. Rho is the log of the um, Radon-Nikodym derivative of the area measure you get down here with respect to Lebesgue measure. Okay. Um, and uh, so the nice thing here is if I give you any old crazy measure, any old crazy random surface, you can kind of encode it by just having this single one parameter function down here that tells you what happens when you conformally map uh, back to this disk. So um, I have pictures by uh, David Yu, another uh, Stony Brook person. Um, so let me, here, these are just on his web page. You can go look at this. He has conformal maps from various famous works of art onto spheres. A lot of classical Greek sculpture, pictures of a brain, for example, gets mapped onto spheres. And you can see um, these maps are angle preserving locally. That's what makes them conformal. But they distort sizes. So the nose here is much bigger. You know, some things here get get stretched, some get, get shrunk. Um, he does this with higher genus surfaces as well. Um, you can also think of this as uh, a way of putting coordinates on the chart, because I, I can go over here and put a, a grid on one of these flat surfaces, and then pull back the grid up to the surface upstairs. So if you wanted to ever 
say, play checkers on Michelangelo's David, this is probably how you would get started. You would um, you know, break it into pieces, map each one nicely to a smooth um, a flat surface, put checkers on that, and then pull it back here. OK, so he has you know, lots of lovely pictures of these things. Um, OK, so let me go back. Um, so it's this beautiful story. If you want to understand a random surface, all you have to do is to understand a random one-parameter function, this row function that encodes everything. So again, you parameterize the space of all surfaces with the space of, say, smooth real-valued functions. And if rho is equal to 0, you just get you know, the disk you started with. Um, and, and generally, if the Laplacian of rho is 0, i.e. if rho is harmonic, then the surface is flat. So geometrically, it's a flat surface. Um, and question, if you want to take, choose a random surface, you want to choose a random row. And if you want your surface to be somehow a perturbation of a flat metric, you want to choose row as sort of the canonical perturbation of a harmonic function. And sort of the natural way to do that is something called the Gaussian free field. So the discrete Gaussian free field is a, is a random surface on a grid um, where uh, you look at all functions from the grid to reals, and the uh, the probability measure is proportional to uh, the sum over all edges of the height difference from one neighbor to the other squared. So you take e to the minus this sum, or minus a half times this sum, uh, times some normalizing constant. And this is now a Gaussian random variable in this high dimensional space, the dimension of which is your number of interior vertices. And it gives you a random function. Uh, from your, your grid to the plane. So here's some pictures of these generated with Mathematica, of these random functions. And again, this sum here will be very large if you have a highly discontinuous function. So, um, uh, so this is kind of forcing the function not to, to fluctuate too wildly. Um, so it's in some sense a perturbation of a harmonic function um, in the sense that this, thing is, this sum here is minimized if the function is harmonic. And, uh, and in the fine mesh limit, this random function converges to something called the Gaussian free field, okay. which uh, is a standard gas with respect to this Dirichlet inner product, we call it, which is this Gaussian field is also invariant under conformal maps. It has a lot of lovely symmetries. Okay. But it turns out this Gaussian field is not actually a function. It's only a generalized function. You can't make sense of its value at points, but you can make sense of, say, the integral of this function times a, a smooth test function. OK, now, Liouville quantum gravity is what you get when you take e to the gamma h, where this h is the Gaussian free field. And, um, and so we just think of, imagine we have some crazy random fractal surface, but instead of describing that surface embedded in three space in some way, we just imagine we have conformally mapped to the a disk, and we set about describing the measure that corresponds to the pullback of the area measure. And everything's encoded by that. Um, so here, uh, I did a, a version of this. I took e to the gamma hz. And um, uh, this, again, was introduced by Polyakov in the 80s. I guess he had hints of it in 1979 uh, when he was interested in, in string theory, like I said. Um, this e to the gamma h doesn't really make sense if h is a distribution. Um, uh, you know, what does that even mean if this h is something oscillating between plus and minus infinity, not defined at points. How do I make sense of this? Well, it turns out there are various regularization procedures where you um, replace h by maybe a smoothing out of h. You know, you can mollify with a bump function of some kind. And then this thing makes perfect sense. And then you take the limit as that mollification function gets uh, smaller. The support of it gets smaller and smaller. So harmonic. Uh, no, That's no. That's a well-defined thing to say, right, for a distribution. Case. Yeah, no, no, not even close. No, I mean, it's all over between plus and minus infinity. Uh -huh. it, it's, it's plus and minus infinity both on a dense set. It's as far from harmonic, subharmonic as, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's wild. Um, but yeah, it's not too crazy. I mean, you can look at the average value of it on a disk makes sense, for example. Or on, even on a circle, you can make sense of it. So, um, OK. 
Now, uh, so you can, and it turns out you can make sense of this also, this e to the gamma, it's a random measure. And, um, and one way to illustrate a measure, a random measure, is to say, let me divide you into a bunch of squares that all have about the same size in this random measure. The way I do that is I fix a cutoff value delta, and I say, let's take this and cut it into four, cut each of those into four, and keep re repeating until I get to a square whose area is less than delta. If the area is less than delta, I stop subdividing that square. And I subdivide some other squares, and I keep going until all of my squares that are left have area less than delta. And so now somehow each square has area less than delta, but its dyadic parent has area more than delta. So in some sense, that suggests the squares you see are of the same order in size. They're all less than delta, but their dyadic parents are all bigger than delta, so up to sort of constant area. You, th you think of them all as being about the same size. Okay, and so here you see, even with gamma being this relatively small value, 0.5, we have a lot of fluctuations here. So some places we have uh, kind of sparse, a few squares. Other places here we have very dense set of squares. And as um, you take larger values of gamma, this becomes a, a more and more pronounced effect. So big squares, and here you have a lot of very tiny squares. Okay. Now, um, let's think about a continuum space-filling path. Uh, this is a, um, an SLE 6 on a uh, Louisville quantum gravity surface. So it's a, um, and it's encoded by colors. So it's a little hard for you to, to see what's going on. But what I actually did is, uh, this is a curve. If I, if I go through the spectrum of colors, that tells me how to trace out the curve. So I start here, trace, fill out this way, this, come all the way around here, back around here, fill all this, and then come back to here. And it's actually using a very fine uh, spectrum of colors. And when you see a gap here, red here, blue here, that means I filled up all the blue, and then only much later in time did I come back and fill back up the red. So the places where you see these lines means I did this and this at fairly time-separated places. Okay, but this is just an image of, of a space-filling SLE-6. So it turns out that even when SLE-6 is, um, hits itself, there's a natural way to extend it to a space-filling curve, where after it hits itself, you go on the inside and then come out. OK, so this is another object that we will we'll be discussing. OK, and now, finally, the last of my stories, uh, random growth. Um, so let's say I associate with a graph, VE, ID weights. Uh, there's something called the Eden model, introduced in 1961 by Eden, which is you take this grid, and you um, basically, uh, you start out at a point and you pick uniformly a neighbor of that point and you add it. Then you pick a neighbor of the uniformly a neighbor of the cluster you have then and you add it. And in the limit, you get some crazy shape like this. But you can also think of it as a ball in this metric where I assign ID exponential edge weights to each edge. And I look at what's the metric ball. Sorry, what do you mean by added? I, I did. Okay. I All right, so, so I'm going to show a, a picture of that in a minute. But for, for the first thing, what I just do is I assign a random number to each graph, and I get a, um, a, a metric space on the graph where the distance across an edge is just the number. And, and then I look at balls in this random metric. Um, and I, I color points according to their distance from the origin. So that's how I get this picture here. Okay. And the, and the edge weights are chosen IID exponential rate one random variables. But now, um, so let me show you my, uh, this other story. I can pick a point, choose uniformly from the set of neighbors a new point and add that. Then choose the neighbors of this cluster of two blue points, uniformly one of those, add that. Choose from the neighborhood of the, this, add that. And if you think about it for a while, using the memoryless property of exponentials, you can show that this is actually growing the same way as the previous picture. So, um, but anyhow, you have this growing sequence of balls, which was used to, to model cancer growth, or 
lichen growth things originally that you imagine, you know, each of the boundary places has some chance of getting corrupted uniformly at random. And then, you know, how do these things kind of gradually grow? Um, OK, here's another process called DLA. And here, you start with a point in the middle. And you, um, uh, instead of picking a point uniformly from the neighbors, you run a, brownie, run a simple random walk from far away and pick the first neighbor that it reaches. And what you have in mind here is that you, you have a growing snowflake, right? It starts out with one little particle of ice. And then some water molecule comes from far away, does a simple random walk until it comes and hits this structure. And when it hits it, it freezes there. And another particle comes far away, and when it hits, it freezes. And then gradually, you grow some sort of fractal shape. Okay, this was invented by Witten and Sander in 81. Um, and uh, here's an actual physical model of, of this. This is a copper sulfate solution. I just pulled this off of the uh, Wikipedia article on DLA. Um, so this is kind of a, a three-dimensional uh, version of DLA. Here's a two-dimensional version um, of uh, manganese oxide patterns on the surface of a rock. Um, here's uh, another one of those. You sometimes get similar things with lichen growing on surfaces. Here, this is actually a frozen lightning bolt, meaning that they, um, you take a, a block of plexiglass and you run a huge charge through it. And the charge is actually sears. It burns patterns in the places that it goes through. And what's left is an actual picture, an image of, of the lightning bolt, of the big bolt of electricity. And uh, you can buy these online. You can purchase one of these. They're kind of expensive, but they're, but they're cool. And, um, uh, and these, these are sometimes described what they call dielectric breakdown models, which is a, um, a, a kind of a generalization of, of DLA, where you choose instead of from harmonic measure, from harmonic measure to some power. Um, now, this DLA model, uh, you know, it appears all over in the physics literature. We find about 12,000 results if you put diffusion-limited aggregation in uh, Google Scholar, in quotes. Um, but I actually, for fun, looked through the first 500 of those results, and I found only four of them are in math journals. Um, almost entirely, this has been done by people in physics. And in some sense, it represents a great failure on the part of mathematics. Um, that we just have not been able to understand this very well at all. And people who are actually interested in these subjects aren't waiting for us. They're just sitting down doing simulations. And, uh, and the subject has evolved largely based on simulations. You actually say, well, if I had this type of material and this sort of structure, what would happen? Well, let me just run a few models on my computer and see what they look like. And, um, and we haven't been able to keep up uh, in terms of proving theorems. Um, uh, does this have some sort of scaling limit? What's the shape at large scales? Does the macroscopic shape look like a tree? What's the asymptotic dimension? Uh, Schramm famously in 2006 made this somewhat controversial statement that the only theorem in DLA is Harry Keston's theorem that says that the, uh, the planar cluster after n steps grows no faster than n to the 2 thirds. So some sort of bound on how fast this thing was growing. Um, but you know, there's some variants of DLA that are understood, but there's really very little uh, about this DLA itself. And you might, if you wanted to make your life even harder, ask, well, what if you did DLA on one of these random planar maps? OK, well, now we finally get to part two, the drama, where we'll start to do crazy things like that. So we have our actors. Remember, we have our random curves. We have our random trees. We have our random surfaces. And we have our random growth models. And we have this motivating story to tie it all together, which was these lovely matings of Julia sets. OK. so. First thing I note is that there's actually a way to conformally weld together uh, these quantum surfaces. These Louisville quantum gravity surfaces come with a natural boundary measure on them. And um, if you take two of these surfaces, you can stitch them together along their boundaries according to this measure, conformally map the result into a new random surface. And on this new surface, this interface becomes one of these SLE curves. And um, 
And there's a whole theory of stitching together different surfaces of different types to get different SLE curves in the interface. And, uh, but in some sense, it's as simple as saying if I take two canonical random surfaces and glue them together, the seam between them becomes a canonical random path. And what could be a simpler statement than that? Um, another thing you might ask, what happens if you glue together two random trees? Well, here, take these two. Remember I said that if I take this tree and I connect underneath it, I get this uh, tree. And I do the same thing upstairs now with this thing flipped upside down. I have two trees. Now, watch this. Some magic will occur shortly. I glue the trees together by just stitching together these lines at the bottom. Now, I, d I identify points if they're on the same green horizontal line or if they're on the same red line. Okay? And um, what's the resulting structure of this new object? The answer is it's a sphere with a space filling path. So, something called Moore's theorem lets you see a priori that this thing will be topologically a sphere. And then you can use some nice structure to show that this is a sphere with a space filling path. It's something we call a piano sphere. The sphere comes with this special structure of this space filling path that somehow encodes a lot of information about the sphere. Now, this sphere also comes with a, a natural measure, in the sense that if I look at, uh, um, I mean, there's a, there's a parametrization of this path in the sphere where I say, uniformly march through these red lines from left to right. That tells me a speed at which to trace through the this space filling path. And I can just ass assert that I fill unit length, unit area in unit time. And that actually gives me a definition of a measure on the sphere, just by requiring that the measure of a set is the amount of time I spend in that set as I, as I go through the case filling it. So I now get a sphere with a measure and a curve on it. Okay? And, um, all right. And here, this is just making some observations about these equivalence classes, how you might actually prove that this thing is honestly a sphere. But I'm going to skip that point because I want to do something else and say that you can also glue together two levy trees. So if I have a process, there's something called a levy process, which always jumps down but sort of drifts up. And you have these, some of you have seen this before, these so-called levy processes. They're, they're like analogs of Brownian motion, but they have these jumps, these random processes. So they're discontinuous. And so I've, I've illustrated these discontinuities in red when they jump upward. And, and upstairs, I've, I've done an independent version of this thing flipped upside down. And now what I do is I draw these, um, for each jump, I draw a little black curve to the side of it. And now this, this graph now suddenly becomes continuous again. I have a, a continuous kind of curve in R2, upstairs and downstairs. And, um, and then I do this identification. When I do this identification, you see that uh, for each of these jumps, the two, top and bottom of the jump get stitched together. And, what, and the jump becomes, this is sort of a, a disk, topologically a disk. And so I end up with a pair of trees stitched together. And this should remind you of what we had at the beginning, where we had this, this pair of Julia sets stitched together. OK. Now, the beauty is it turns out here, this piano sphere here, the space filling case, it is actually a. SLE curve, canonical random curve, on top of a Louisville quantum gravity. So this says you take two canonical random trees, glue them together, and what you get is a canonical random curve drawn on top of a canonical random surface. Okay. And here this says, well, there's a variant of this where you then take these, uh, these variant of trees, trees, a canonical tree of disks, if you like, glue those together, and if you plug in these quantum surfaces for each of these little quantum disks for each of these guys here and glue them together, you end up getting um, a, uh, one of these SLE kappa curves that's non-space filling that hits itself, also drawn on top of a sphere. OK, so um, all right. And uh, 
the scaling limit of this exploration map on a random planar map, you know, it should be this SLE6 on this quantum gravity surface. But using this welding machinery, we can actually understand all of the bubbles cut out of the unexplored regions that we, we, we observe. And, um, and that will actually help us in terms of making sense of this random growth on random surfaces. So um, all right. So can you do it? So we showed before how to tile the surface with dyadic squares that are about the same size. So one thing you could do is try to run DLA on that set of squares and take a fine mesh limit. Or maybe run one of these dielectric breakdown models on this. Or um, What happens there? And now finally I have for you some more pictures. OK, so here let's actually see what happens. Okay, I think if I do command, check. OK, here this is. This is a growing metric ball, like that Eden model, except that now I have an additional source of randomness, which is that I chose one of those random square tilings instead of a regular grid, and I'm doing Eden model on that. Okay, And see how it's much less round than it was before. It starts to, but you know, you have these kind of lovely patterns, like an oil spill or something. Um, let's try another one. Here's with a slightly larger value of, of gamma. And you see it starts to kind of pinch off these bubbles before it's done. These bubbles play a very important part in our, our theory. Um, so occasionally, you know, it pinches off region and then gradually fills it up. Here's an even larger value. Well, let's go even larger. These things are normalized so that um, it takes a unit of time, or it goes through all the colors in the time it takes to fill like 80% of the space or 90% of the space. So when you get to these larger values, it goes much more quickly at the beginning. And it's basically because most of your volume is in a few areas that it takes a really long time to get to, which correspond to these far away regions in the, in the map. Um, so here, see how fast it goes here. Here, most of your space is in these really little tiny regions. OK, now here's DLA. This is just regular old DLA. And I want you to observe that it seems to be growing in a kind of roundish way. It's weird, but not too weird. Um, and we'll see that as we start doing DLA on these crazy random surfaces, it starts to have a little more personality. So here's 0.5. You start to see these patterns. It's no longer nearly quite so round. It still looks like DLA, but different structure to it. And a particular one I want to emphasize is here. Well, here, when you get around, uh, say, 1.25, it starts to get close to the, um, close to the square root of 2, which turns out to be a special value. So these things are what we sometimes call Chinese dragons. I have some Chinese graduate students who have confirmed for me these are indeed Chinese dragons. You know, it has kind of a long spine and some sort of legs hanging off of it. Uh, lots of pretty colors. Um, and, uh, and the nice thing is that it turns out, in some ways, these Chinese dragons, despite looking more complicated than regular DLA, are actually simpler to analyze. So oops, let me go to my, back to my Adobe. Um, so it turns out. OK, we're going to call the candidate scaling limit for this guy QLE, quantum Lovner evolution. Um, QLE, gamma squared eta. Uh, gamma will be the parameter that indicates what type of random surface we have. Um, and eta will be the parameter that tells you what type of growth model you do. Is it just Eden model, where you choose uniformly a point? Is it DLA, where you choose from harmonic measure viewed from far away? Or do you take harmonic measure to the eta-th power for some eta? OK. Here is eta model on a um, uh, root 8 over 3 Louisville quantum gravity, which turns out to be a very sp special choice um, for eta model. And I want you to kind of see here all these different sizes of squares. And here, where the squares are very dark and there aren't very many of them, you know, it's harder to get through there. Here, you know, places where there are more squares, you, the growth spreads, spreads through those places faster. Um, 
And here's DLA, the special version of DLA, uh, on a square root of root 2 Louisville quantum gravity surface. OK. Basically, there's a story that says if we start with an Edom model and let it grow randomly in this way, um, on a, we could do it on a random triangulation. And in a certain sense, at any stage, the law of the unexplored region outside only depends on the length of the boundary. We haven't obtained any for inf more information on what's outside. So you have this nice Markovian property for what you explore. And it turns out that you can make sense of that in the continuum. OK, so, um, so one thing you could do is imagine you're exploring a percolation interface. So you color your things, uh, your triangles blue and, and yellow, and explore a percolation interface. Then pick a new point, explore an interface, pick a new point, explore an interface, pick a new point, explore an interface. That also expects the Markovian structure of the map. And the beauty is that this is something you can do in the continuum. So let me, I draw an SLE on one of the top of one of these uh, maps, randomly resample my next point, draw a new one, randomly resample my next point, draw a new one, and repeat, and continue. And by doing this, ultimately, I'm able to make sense of the limiting growth process. And I want to kind of stress you know, how somehow strange this is. We want to understand this growth model on this QLE surface. And what we use is the fact that we understand the canonical random curve on the canonical random surface. And we know how to kind of randomly reshuffle, uh, at draw a bit, reshuffle, draw a bit, reshuffle. So you're applying a random reshuffling to a canonical curve on top of a canonical surface endowed with a canonical measure in order to understand a canonical random growth. Okay. And, uh, and this can all be understood as somehow reshuffling the exploration procedure that's associated to this piano sphere exploration process. And if you do the same thing with, uh, with an SLE2 process, you get this DLA cluster. You're reshuffling um, DLA. OK. And so it turns out that among these eta uh, gamma pairs, there's a certain family of those that we can understand very well using this procedure, this reshuffling procedure. So even though we cannot yet understand uh, eta equals 0, or eta equals 1 and gamma squared equals 0, which would correspond to DLA on the Euclidean lattice, or regular DLA, say, um, we can understand DLA on one of these random graphs. And we can also understand uh, this thing, which actually enables us to really understand how this Brownian map can be conformally embedded in the plane. So we actually get this tr conformal structure of the Brownian map by using the fact that this growth model explores metric balls on the metric surface. So this is actually what we're working on to show the metric structure. So we can give it a stochastic partial differential equation that, that the growth satisfies. We can prove various properties of these growth models. Um, in progress, we're understanding more about the phases of these models. And what we'd really like to do is figure out how to understand these models off of those two special orange curves. OK. And that's, that's it. Yes? Uh, are there any predictions for DLA critical exponents? And, and yeah, so not for regular DLA. So for DLA on these random planar maps, you take a random tree decorated planar map, and then do DLA on that, that we can produce the exponents exactly. So we can sort of solve anything you want, exponents, whatever. We get everything perfectly for this one DLA on this particular type of random planar map. Um, DLA in the grid, we still don't know. I mean, the physicists have a guess from simulations. They might say it's about 1.6 or 1.7, um, depending on exactly the model you use. But, um, uh, but we, we, we don't have a way of, of giving that. Yes. Is there any other questions?